Welcome to the Whiskey Tribe. Today we're gonna have an interesting conversation because it's all about the tasting truth snobs don't want you to know. Yes, it's it's basically reality is almost entirely subjective. Almost. Look, there's some elements that can be measured, but we're gonna get into that with a very special guest coming out here. But at the, at the end of the day, man, there's a lot of people in the world that want to try and convince you that however you are experiencing enjoying your whiskey is wrong. Yeah. And there's a whole another echelon, a tier of quality and expertise that you small little peasant couldn't possibly comprehend. Daniel, let's get into that. <laughs> this is Eric Waite. Quickly, let's get some context here. Eric, wine sommelier, what's your experience level? 20 plus years in wine. Uh, went back to college, studied enology, interned to three different wineries. Uh, got a, I'm a certified sommelier with the Court of Master Sommelier's French Wine Scholar at the Wine Scholar Guild and a diploma from the Wine Spirit Educational Trust. While studying for the WSET diploma, got introduced to whiskey, because that was one of the units, and bam, next thing I know, I changed roots and got into whiskey. Course corrected. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But it's, become, but, but it's been a benefit because I brought not only tasting skills, having been trained with Master Sommeliers, but there's a lot of wine finishings in, in, mm -hmm. in whiskeys. And so having that background and understand and how to retro-engineer whiskey, yeah. understanding um, primary, secondary, and tertiary characteristics of what went into the glass. Yeah. The, the whiskey experience, it's gonna change drastically based on the whiskey we had previously, or the meal we had, or how the time of day. It is so subjective, but I wanna take that to a deeper level and talk about specifically how it's subjective. And in my head, there's three main areas. There's the physical experience, the psychological experience, and the cultural experience. That's Let's start with the physical experience. Sure. So how the sensors are involved. You know, probably 90% of your senses come, come through your nose, but your nose, we can detect like a trillion different things, but you're programming your nose as to how you'll be able to identify this with that. And so that comes with your private, previous experience. There's a subjectivity in terms of, this reminds me of Christmas cake. You hear people in Scotland use Christmas cake. Yeah. And, and there's yeah. candies over there that we don't get here, so I don't know what they're talking about, but there's an objectivity as well as there's certain things that everybody gets these certain characteristics. And that which is the reason why you can be take an exam. So right now I could blind taste Daniel just by describing a whiskey and without him even tasting it, and he's gonna go, that sounds like this. Absolutely. Because if you couldn't do that. Yeah, there'd be no such thing as an exam. You couldn't test anything. Absolutely. absolutely. So it, there's a difference. What we're talking about is a difference between subjective and objective reality. Absolutely. And in all reality, there are some objective things and there are some subjective things. So let's talk about sight, for example. If uh, there's a lot of science that says that the red that I see right here is not the red that you're seeing and it's not the red that you're seeing. However, if I said, get me the bottle with the red spot on it, you could all find it. Right. So there's a difference between my nuanced version of understanding and sort of the global category that I am describing that we can all find common Venn diagram overlap on. Right. The other thing about subjective your taste is some things are a little more exact and some are by analogy. Right. It's not exact. This is kind of like this, kind of like that. Sometimes the, the characters you're given are different than mine, but we're kind of in the same ballpark. Right. It's not exact, because some aromas and flavors are gonna be unique to that whiskey, and that's when you get a little bit more poetic. All right, so when you taste it, how much of, uh, of what you're experiencing, the physical realm of trying things, is impacted by taste versus smell? There's a retronasal, so mm -hmm. if you have a really bad cold, which, or you had dental work done, I've been there, done that, right. and the exam's only given once a year, you don't put it off for a year, you go ahead and take it, but you learn how to taste differently oh. because the reality is most of it's coming through the nose and you can still taste when after you swallow, right. things are coming back up as well. Pro tip. Pro tip. Just throw up in your mouth a little. Just throw up in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm hearing you guys correctly, it sounds like the physical experience of taste comes down, you know, largely to smell, but it also comes down to other reference points you have for flavors? You can't call upon patterns that you don't have. So your brain is a pattern recognition machine to experience this environment and then look for matching data, right? right? And so when you're starting out new to whiskey or wine or right. anything, you can't expect to be finding all these patterns that you haven't actually built into your brain yet. If you're starting from the place of everybody around you is smelling and tasting the whiskey and they're naming off all of these elaborate notes and you try and it's like, it just tastes like whiskey, you're Fine. Yeah. You just need the reference points. So if you hear a descriptor from someone, you don't know what that is, or you read about it, go to Whole Foods or whatever and start getting those flowers, get those fruits, get those spices. You wanna know? Here's a pro tip. When you're in a table full of uh, whiskey nerds, 
they love nothing better than to talk about whiskey and try to show you things. <laughs> so, so what you do is you're like, I don't know if I'm getting that. Where, what did you say you were getting? Uh, maybe a little more. And then, <laughs> and then you just get them to pour your shit all night long. You're like, I'm. I think I've almost got it. Maybe. Can you give me another comparison? I've taught you so well. <laughs> <laughs> We talked about the the physical mechanics of taste, but then it also draws on reference points and associative memories. Let's talk about the mind game, the psychological, this. the emotional element that goes into the experience of tasting and enjoying whiskey. No matter what you know, no matter how many patterns you've built, no matter how good you are at what you do, you are a human being and you can be fooled by context and things that are coming before and after and packaging and the wrappings of how you're served something. For example, 1976 Judgment of Paris. The Judgment of Paris. Bum 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 bum. bum, bum. bum. <laughs> <laughs> so Steven Spirier, uh, this guy was a promoter of French wines and he wanted to gather all of the most well-known wine connoisseurs and experts all in one place. He wants to host a uh, wine competition on French soil with French judges blind, and he brings some unknown uh, California wines there. The expectation is, of course, the French are better. Uh, I'm a Francophile, I would expect them to be better. And the press thought it was such a non event that, oh, the French, the world thought that the French are just gonna clean up, they're just showing off those poor Americans with the pitiful wines. This is going to be embarrassing, but let's all drink some French wine and have a wonderful time. The only press that showed up was Time Magazine, and the moment this guy realized he may have a story is whenever connoisseur, well known and respected, ah, back to France. And it was. A California wine. And the result is these two Americans won uh, and it was a scandal that rocked around the world and what happened was everybody goes oh we can make great wines anywhere in the world. And the sort of funny thing is this it keeps happening it's not a one time but we got this deja vu going. Ten years later they did it again, ten years later they did it again and then the third Psalm movie if, you, if you've seen it they do it with Pinot Noir and sure enough you have Fred Dame the master sommelier of master sommeliers uh, you have Steven Spurrier, Jantas yeah. Robinson the master wine of master wines get blinded on three Pinot Noirs and Jantas Robinson pulls out a California thinking it's Burgundy as her favorite. Uh, but this is going on now with the whiskey world as well. Okay. It doesn't have to be Kentucky and it doesn't have to be Scotland. There's places around the world where we can make absolutely fantastic whiskeys. If I pour you a fancy whiskey and we're sitting in one of the fanciest restaurants in Austin, right. and it gets brought out in a Glen Cairn, I say, let me show you something. Right. right. You're gonna have one experience. If we're in my car and I get out a four ounce stainless steel flask and I find some plastic little sippy cups, I'm like, you gotta try this, it's real good. What we're talking about is the reason why distilleries, wineries, breweries, uh, they spend money on packaging. Because yeah. there's so many people that will walk down the aisle and just look for things that are beautiful because they don't, that's all they have to go on. This is the reason E150A exists. Yeah. It's just perceptive quality and consistency. We talked recently about whenever you know how much money was spent on a spirit. If it's very expensive, you're that much more likely to enjoy it. This is a $400 bottle or whatever. Oh, shit. Then, oh, holy shit. And they, this is a known thing. So they actually studied the brain and the response of the pleasure centers in the brain to drinking wine and people, when they were told they were drinking fancy, expensive wine, the pleasure centers of their brain reacted more than when they were drinking the cheap wine they thought. Now, it wasn't true, but that's that's real. That's not just perceived reality. Because that's, of status. That's brain chemistry. Right. You actually literally enjoyed yourself more because you thought you should. But a fancier bottle and a bigger price tag has higher status. I want higher status. I want to be more reputable. I want to be in the special class of taters and drinkers, and then therefore if I'm paying this much for it, that puts me in a whole nother class. All the remaining bottles at our distillery are now $120 each. <laughs> Eric, quickly, before we dive into this last segment here, if people want to hang out with you more, you got your own YouTube channel, what's that? I have two channels, one for wine, one for whiskey. Come on, I, I, ju, 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 ju. I want the wine channel. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Waite Whiskey Studies, I also have an Eric Waite Wine Studies, but because whiskey stole my heart, I spent all my time doing the whiskey studies. You know why? because you're a good person. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you, Eric, for hanging out with us. I had a good time. Yeah, yeah good perspective too. coming from the wine into things. And then also, he's on the he's on the straight and narrow now. I think we got him, <laughs> we got him straightened he's out. On the whiskey path. <laughs> on, the whiskey, on the whiskey path. The final uh, piece of the subjectivity of your whiskey experience. For me, this always comes down to the cultural experience. Yeah. This is kind of a loaded issue. It's an inconvenient fact that what uh, human beings are experiencing in, in just the, the physical taste mm -hmm. and then the things that they are mentally, emotionally enjoying from the experience, that is very different from yeah. person to person. There's a tremendous amount of nuance. And so to take a hard line on the right and proper way to enjoy a whiskey is like, well, that doesn't really live up to what we know about human beings and the way they experience and enjoy things. Everybody gets into whiskey from a different direction. Yeah. They have a different door that they walk through, bourbon, scotch, uh, mixes, drinks, and things like that. And as you fall in love with whiskey, your path is gonna be a little bit unique to you. And it's easy to get so in love with it that you sort of prescribe your journey for everyone around you. Yeah, nobody starts out to be an asshole. No. But once they are enthusiastic, they're excited, they start developing preferences, they find like-minded people. Yes. Like-minded people who share those preferences. I found my team, Team Scotch. Right. And, <laughs> and bourbon is stupid. <laughs> Well, that's true. Yeah, no, he's out. But, <laughs> but it's easy as a group to decide that yes, we are the right and correct and proper ones, and we must defend our way of doing things and seeing things and yes. experiencing things. So everybody else must be diminished. They must be lesser. And it's like, man, it's a drink. It's it's amazing. It's fun. It's cool. We love to learn about it. But at the end of the day, whenever you consider that, not only do people have different kinds of experiences with whiskey. Physically, mentally, emotionally, and culturally. There's also different priorities, what they're looking for out of that experience. There's a thing that is, as you take a journey into whiskey, you uh, sort of take these experiences as hallmark moments in order to improve the human experience of life, yeah. right? But then there's a point at which you switch and the experience has become more important than the human part of life. Right. And that's when you start dehumanizing anyone who disagrees with you. Right. Everything comes apart at the seams. Right. As you saw in the conversation, there's just a few things, a few a few main takeaways that I hope you, uh, you, you get from this video. Mm -hmm. One, you are absolutely equipped to experience whiskey like at least 95 percent as deeply as the best out there the only thing separating you from top tier whiskey professionals it's some experiences the reference points training mm -hmm. if you have a nose that smells and you can taste things you have everything you need to start the journey and it's tremendously easy for even the best of the best to get tricked so our priority has never been what's inside of a bottle, right? That's fun, we learn about it. It's, it's the, 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 the catalyst that brings our community together in the Whiskey Tribe. But the most important thing isn't what's in the bottle, it's the human beings around the bottle and having a great experience with those people. That's what we're mostly into. Whiskey can really give you a magical focal point Yes. to uh, build a kick-ass community and a relationship with someone where you can sit down with a shared love and a shared interest. I think the three main guidelines that, you know, as you get into whiskey culture that are gonna be the most helpful in having not only a great tasting experience, but also a great community experience. Number one, the best whiskey is the whiskey you like to drink. And the way you like to drink it. Rule number two, and it's well, these are more guidelines, really. Yes. We, we yes. try not to do we try not to do too many rules, but the, number two is keeping in mind that you are not your whiskey preferences. Yes, that's true of all the things you love in life. They aren't you, they're just things you like. Yeah, so we want people to have preferences. We want people to explore enough for them to develop things that they like and they're gonna find things that they dislike along the way. And whenever somebody talks about the things they dislike, yeah. they aren't rejecting you. They just don't like that thing. It's hard to remember that because when you really love something, when someone else doesn't love it, it can feel personal. That's why we have this third guideline of always giving your magnificent bastards in the Whiskey Tribe the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. And as rarely as possible, <laughs> if ever, needing the benefit of the doubt yourself. Whenever you're giving somebody the benefit of the doubt and understanding that, man, there's whiskey happening here. Mm -hmm. And uh, occasionally it can get ahead of people and they get a little sloppy. Understanding that it's not necessarily coming from a toxic place, a bad place, they just, uh, need a little bit of flexibility with all of those considerations of whiskey being a very subjective hobby and all those considerations of even the best of the best can get fooled and these simple guidelines 
you are absolutely equipped to have an amazing tasting experience, but more importantly, having an amazing community experience yeah. with your whiskey hobby. Absolutely. So if you're wondering what it looks like whenever you approach whiskey with the realization that it's very subjective uh, and there's a lot of room for grace, then there just, there just remains one single question. And that question is, Whiskey Tribe, how do you whiskey? With magnificence!